So amazing fact that here we could literally know that there is a better algorithm than what we discovered because we know that the cyclic structure of the permutation should allow us to do better. How do we know? Well, we know that any permutation without tree cycles could be done with n plus c, where c is the number of cycles. And we know what c is. It's GCD. Right? And by the way, how large is GCD on the average? Is it like yay big? Yay big? Small, very small. Right? So 60% of the cases, it's one. Right? So usually it's only one cycle in this whole thing. Right? G GCD tends to be small. Uh, this 60% comes from a paper by one of O'Neill advisors, Percy Diaconis, who proves that it's around 60%. He has tighter bounds than that. So, uh, of course, the algorithm requires stronger requirements on the iterator. In Grease Mills, what did we do with the iterators? Only one thing, one step forward. We never went backwards. It's pretty remarkable. So it will work even for singly linked list. It really works for anything, any data structure. If we want to do cycles, we need to do what? Long jumps. We have to go to the next element in the cycle, which might not be the next element. It could be far. So we need stronger requirement on the iterators. We need to be able to do random access. Right? But, and also, we need to go through cycles in reverse order. Apparently, it's a great in insight because f all the people who published this algorithm, this algorithm prior to Paul and me would go the wrong way around the cycle. And what happens? You see, if I go the, the cycle is goes this way, then I cannot save myself and go because I need to save that guy and go there. And I don't have any room to put this guy in. And then I sort of, so fundamentally what they do, they actually, in the published code, you swap. So at, at the end, they do every cycle with n minus 1 swaps. Whatever they win, they lose right there. But if I go cycles backwards, not cycle to where I go, but cycle from where I come, it's very easy because I save where I'm standing. I find from where this guy is coming and write him there and there and there and there. And when I exhaust the cycle, I, whomever I'm holding there, I store there, right? Sort of interestingly enough, cycle from is much easier than cycle to. They are symmetric mathematically, but they're not symmetric programmatically. It's just an interesting observation, except the people somehow, and there are some, I mean, for example, the algorithm is described by Dijkstra with doing swaps. You know, sort of the, the idea of carefully analyzing how many assignments is not what people do. This is something, well, people like Paul and I do that. But most people say, well, it's linear time. And, you know, it's linear time whether you use swaps or assignments. Factor of three, who cares about factor of three? Uh, let us look at the cycle from code. Observe that there are some magic incantations in small font. It's valid C++. 
but something which you probably do not understand unless you're a great C++ expert. Uh, I will try to explain what the intent is. You see, what we need to find out, we want to save the guy where we're standing, yes? How do we know the type of the thing where we could save him? We have the iterator, but it's not the iterator type. We don't want to save the iterator. It's the value to where iterator points, which we need to take. To, 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 to create. Therefore, we need something which is known as type functions. Let me assure you, you say use Java. Java does not have type functions. Right? So it's not that, you know, C++ does, but they're ugly. So this is a way of doing a type function. Sort of this magic incantation allows me to say, what is the type of things to which my iterator i points. Right? F for many years, I introduced this 20 years ago. Only now they're discussing putting features in the language to make it explicit type function. Sadly enough, you know, language committees work very, very slowly. So. 20 years for me, you know, sort of, they come to, to talk to me now and say, oh, we have these ideas. And my attitude, guys, I cared 20 years ago. I do not care now because, you know, by the time you're done, I will be dead. So, uh, which is, you know, literally true. Well, at least I will be professionally dead for sure. Otherwise, retired. So, so this is a way, and this is, Sort of all these things which are, which work, but they're, they're sort of confusing hex I put in small font. But the algorithm is very simple. I save the guy. I sort of create a copy because I need to, that's where I'm starting. And uh, I is I and start points at the same, same place. Because I need three pointers, as we'll see. They have very, very simple for loop. I almost never use for loops unless they really look pretty. So in this case, it really looks pretty because J is from I. Sort of there, the guy who will end at I comes from. And while J is not equal start, I'm going around the thing. And then keep going, J is from J. What do I do is I move from where the guy, you know, J is where the guy going into I comes from. So I'm moving him into I and moving J to I and sending J for actually backwards. Right? It's a very simple for loop. And when I am done, I still have this one guy saved. I have to stick him back. It's a very, very simple, nice loop going around. You cannot do it for going to. You have to do it only going from. Which now, sort of, I need to write a transformation for my rotation. Right? Because this code works for any permutation. This has nothing specific to rotation. This is just how to do a cycle. So this is, and I apologize for writing sort of relatively complicated C++, as complicated as we'll ever get, because this is a function object, which means a structure with, which could be applied, which has the following state. It has M1. That M1, remember, it's the, the thing where the element with index 0 goes, is the new middle. We compute him and we'll store him in M1. And then there are two numbers, minus and plus. You see, when you do rotate, sometimes you go forward, sometimes you go backward. 
That is, if you don't fit if rotation, then you actually go backward. So I pre-compute what is forward and what is backward move and keep, keep them there. That, is, that I do when I do construction. So when I'm constructed, give me F, M, and L. And plus is M minus F. This is how, w w that's where the, the guy from, f which go, like the guy who g goes into the position zero comes to the position M minus F. And, and so on. The minus is M minus L, sort of you're going back. And M1 is F plus L minus M, as we discussed. This, this sort of starts the machine. And then it's very simple. When you give me iterator I, I say, is I before M prime? If it is, I add plus. If it, we pass the point, so we will start wrapping around, I add minus a negative thing. Okay. So very, very simple, simple function object. And that's the rotate is, is effectively Sort of these, these are trivial things. We, we don't want to do anything if, if the rotation is by, by zero. It's not interesting. Then we just define a difference type, compute GCD. And then, because first GCD elements belong to different cycles. So we need to do cycle from for GCD number of elements. Okay? Look at look at it at home. Look at it at home. It's it might appear complicated, but again it's less than ten lines, but you should be able to figure it out. It's a very, very instructive algorithm. Uh, was first published by Fletcher and Silva around 1964, I believe, uh, in Communications of ACM, which used to be a great technical journal. It is not anymore. Uh, then, OK, so we found two algorithms. One which works for forward iterators, grease mills, Another one which works for random access iterators. So do cycle one. Apparently, there is a great algorithm which was discovered by I don't know who. Uh, this is very sad. I asked Knuth, and he told me, oh, Von Pratt discovered it. There is no evidence. And uh, basically, Don has this remarkable propensity that if he doesn't know who invented an algorithm in a sense. He, there is no paper he read. He attributes it to one of his buddies who told him about it without any I mean, this is very sad, but that's what he does. He said, well, but I heard it from Von Pratt, and I never saw it mentioned in any paper. Therefore, it was invented by Von Pratt. I don't believe it. Uh, it has been around for very many years, decades, and it's a beautiful, beautiful algorithm called three reverses. This works for bidirectional iterators. You see how very nicely we have three fundamental kind of iterators and we have three algorithms. And this one, I have to dance. You see, we want to rotate. You see, what does it mean we rotate? We do this. Do you agree that's a rotation? Let me show you how I could do this rotation without crossing my head. You observe. It starts with a now between two pinkies. When I rotate, it's between two thumbs. Yes? OK. So what I do is this. Well, 
this, this is actually the rotation. And uh, this is three rotations, actually. One, two, three. And there is this wonderful code which actually will do it. Reverse, reverse, reverse. Reverse one hand, reverse the other hand, and then reverse everything. So re and it's obvious why it works, because in some sense, when you do big reverse, you interchange these two, set, two ranges, except these ranges are in reverse order. So first you reverse both sub-ranges, then they reverse this thing. It is pretty elegant, we have to admit. So, and it's not even 10 lines. Uh, there is a bug. The brace should be on the second line. This. I mean, it's a minor bug. It still compiles, believe it or not. I'm talking about this brace. We tend to put it here. And it escaped. So, uh, well, and at home, you have to figure out how many assignments it does. You should be able to do it. Uh, I mean, it's probably, roughly speaking, within the same ballpark as grease mills, right? Think about it. How many swaps do we need to do a rotate? We discussed it in the last lecture. N over 2. It's about N swaps. It's about 3N assignments. There are plus minus 1 to do rotate. N over 2 swaps. To do reverse, pardon me. I, uh, I meant to say that in the last lecture, we, we saw that to perform a reverse, we need n over 2 swaps. Reverse rotate, it's now, by now it's all the same to me, guys. So, uh, OK. Now, what is the problem? There is this horrible problem that, you see, while this piece of code does it, it doesn't quite do what we need. It doesn't find the new middle. And I was desperate to find new middle. And in 1998, I, caught, I taught similar course, all of my courses at SGI. There was once upon a time, there was a company called SGI. And I taught a course there. And I was standing there saying that this defeats my whole purpose because I know how to find the midpoint for grease mills. It's trivial to find midpoint for uh, cyclic one because these are random axis iterators. You just do arithmetic. And, uh, but for three reverses, I don't know how. And the next class, two of my favorite top students in the class were two Chinese gentlemen who were sort of literally attached to each other like that. And one name was Lo, and another name was Ho. So this is, I'm going to tell you about Lo Ho algorithm. Great guys. Uh, they went to high school together, then they went to uh, the best university in Hong Kong together, which they graduated with one being number one, another one being number two. Then both of them went to UC Davis, where they defended their dissertations within one day of each other. And then they both came to work for SGI. Uh, so, and they were stellar students, stellar students. They, they did a whole bunch of interesting things. So they come to me and say, oh, but it's trivial. I said, what do you mean it's trivial? How do I find it? They say, oh, you implement a function called reverse until. You see, let us, we have first, middle, last. So let's do the reverse till either first or last hits the middle. Then the one which didn't hit the middle will be pointing to the new middle. Right? So then, with the help, do you understand how this guy works? It's very simple. You just keep moving first and last from both sides till either one or the other hits 
the middle. And then you return both. You, you don't even want to sort out which one is hit the middle. So then there is this beautiful algorithm. Low ho, I should have said. Rotate. So we do reverse and reverse. This is simple. We reverse subranges. Then we do reverse until. And then we reverse the rest. But we saved the guy re returned by reverse until. And we check which one of them is the right one, which one hit the middle. And we return him. And we're done. We are not doing any extra work. This is the beauty. I mean, sort of, the whole point was to find the new middle without doing extra work. So now we have three versions. You see, we, we do it like so. We pass. This is a part of, again, a way in general we want the compiler to, because compiler should know whether iterate is by direction or forward. It should just go at the first line there and pick the correct algorithm. But of course, it doesn't work like that, because this is just uh, you know some some something. It, it doesn't know what it is. There's no semantical knowledge. So we have to do explicit thing. We have types on which we do the dispatch. So this takes a bidirectional iterator tag type. It's not a value. It's a it's a name of a type. And it's vacuous type. It has nothing. It has no values. So we use it to do type dispatch. So this is the top level rotate. This is okay, this is template metaprogramming mumba jumba. And I invented it and it's horrible. Okay? But we have to do it because you know we do not have right mechanisms for doing it. So so what we do. We want to do rotate from first, middle, last. And we want the right algorithm for the iterator type being picked. So what we do, we construct a variable C of this sort of thing, which, which has the right type. And then we call rotate with the right type. And I, I don't usually put in line, but I put in line here. This is mumbo jumbo, but at least it doesn't generate any code. In other words, it's, it's like object-oriented mumbo jumbo, but it doesn't generate code and does not affect performance. It's dispatch, but dispatch, on, I mean, on types. So, but it's still, it's still awful. You cannot do it in Java, by the way. Not at all. Not anyhow. Here you do it terribly, but at least you could do it. People say you could do it in Haskell in some sense, but there are other problems in Haskell. In any case, I don't think you could get a job programming. <laughs> yeah. So now observe that we learn how to do rotate, and we use the reverse. So now let us do a little bit about reverse. And by the way, there was one question about reverse, which I asked you at the end of the lecture last time to learn how to do reverse for forward iterator without using much storage. Remember? I'm sure all of you did it. So it's very easy to do reverse for bidirectional iterators. Everybody should see that. Right? So while not empty and more than one element, because you don't really need to reverse a range with one element. Well, at least you don't need to do anything about reversing it. You swap and swap. Right? It's, it's really. Uh, by the way, why don't I return anything from reverse? It might be a question. I could return this sort of 
point around the midpoint? I don't know any users. Again, I spent many years using these reverse rotates and things like that. Never found a use. Does mean that there is no use. This is why I'm telling you. That if you might discover there is a use, and then you should propose that the interface should be changed. So far, I haven't. So the law applies only to returning useful information. Now, interestingly enough, these reverse is somewhat suboptimal because for every swap, we do two comparisons, right? On the average, two comparisons, unfortunately. Very often, you could l survive with less work. That is, if you know n, even if you are still bidirectional iterator, if by hook or by crook, you know the length of your, say, doubly linked list, you could do less because you could figure out how many, what is the trip count. The trip count is a technical term compiler guys use saying how many times you go through the loop. So the trip count is n divided by 2. We, we need to do n divided by 2 swaps. So we could pre-compute what it is right away by just shifting n by, by 1. That's divide by 2 in C. And then while n is greater than 0, we do swap. I could have written n minus minus here. Then it would fit on one line. Ryan, try to remind me. So, uh, Right? There is a constant struggle between writing it in C style on beautiful style. My friend Paul has been working me for years to, to make me abandon all this stuff like that. But I revert back to my evil ways. So this is, you know, about C. You could write things like that in C. So, uh, OK? So if we do reverse end. And what it means that that's a problem. Try to unroll this. This is easy to unroll. And while you unroll it, read about Duff's device. If you don't know what Tom Duff invented, you should know. It's one of the most horrible things on earth. <laughs> but very useful for loop unrolling. It's in Wikipedia. Uh, now, if we are reversing random access iterators, right now we have a beautiful way of doing it. Because for random access iterator, sort of figuring out the distance is trivial. Random access iterators, simply speaking, they're like pointers with the same complexity behavior. So you just subtract. You get the length, and it goes very quickly during reverse. And here we come to an interesting problem of how do we do it? So we have one for bidirectional, we have one for random, and we don't have one for forward iterators. The, the, by the way, the historical fact is that I knew how to do it for forward iterators uh, before I did STL, but I didn't put it on STL. Why? Well, the answer is that it's, relatively speaking, slow. So do you put an algorithm where you actually feel that what people need to do is to copy their singly linked list out, reverse it, and copy it back? Or so I was not sure. But let us, let us see what could be done, because it's very, very instructive. We're going to learn many techniques which we are going to be using the next journey for much more important algorithms. I'm not saying that reversing singly linked list is crucial. But what I'm saying is the techniques, how we will do it, are very, very important. And I thought it's a nice sort of juicy conclusion for this, for this course. So you see 
the idea is, in some sense, paradoxical. The idea is that, as I told you, we could implement rotate with the help of reverse. But now, let me tell you, I could implement reverse with the help of rotate. It's, it's, things are just so interesting. OK, let's do it with dancing, OK? So what we do, I'm trying to now reverse these guys, reverse these guys. So, and I say, I don't know how to reverse 10 guys, but I know how to reverse five guys. Recursion. So, if I could reverse five guys, then I could do, and I know how to rotate forward at 90. I do this. And this, believe it or not, is, is the reverse. I'm just showing you that this is the reverse. Right? So this is the idea of this algorithm. Sort of basically, OK, there's some stuff which is just, it's, let us go through line by line. If the length of the range is 0, there is not much to do. Everybody agrees? By the way. Observe that this reverse recursive returns something. It's very often important to return things because it saves you computation. And here the trick is that we're dealing with forward iterators. What is expensive for forward iterators? What's expensive for forward iterators is to get, say, to the midpoint is expensive. So let us see how we could design an algorithm which will be separating things at the middle without reaching the midpoint. We could do that. Okay? So if n is 0, we return f. If n is 1, we return f plus 1. Right? And we don't need to, to do anything. We're done. One element ranges are reversed by nature. Now, let's assume, let us assume that it's bigger. Then we could get half. H stands for half. And we do it by shifting. We want to be real C programmers. We don't want to do quotient. Right? It's faster, so why not? So we get, we get half of n. And that's fast. These are integers. And then we say reverse recursive FH. Somehow it does recursive and returns the end of the range. That's the deal. We're not returning middle. We're returning the end of the reverse range. That's the convention. We could have any convention we like. Right? So we say. The sub problem will return us the midpoint. Right? Then here we need to do a little tricky thing. We need to advance the midpoint by 0 or 1, depending on whether n is even or odd. You don't really need to touch the odd point if you have five elements. The third element does need to be moved, so we're skipping him. So now M points to the next sub problem. So I would do reverse recursive calling of this sub problem, and which gives us L, which we need to return. And then we swap ranges, N. We know N, which is H. These ranges are of the same size. You go and sw swap them, and then you return L. The amazing thing, it's not clear who does the work. Right? It's, well, the stack does the work, but you know. it's not a very deep stack. It's log n stack. I think it's very pretty. I, you know, it's not 
It's one of these things when you sort of look at it, there's something, something profound. You say, no, no, but it's not practically useful. We don't know that yet. This is not. But maybe we could make something out of it. We still have half an hour left. So let us see what we could do. So you understand how it works? Yes? Uh, M equals at once? No, no, no. Advance is a, in a STL mutate. It's like plus plus. It's mutational. Uh, you know. Advance advances the variable. Yeah. We tested it. It works. So, plus, uh, you know, for whatever reason, advance is a version of plus plus. It's an action, not a transformation. It operates. It takes this guy by reference. Th this is how it is. And this, I, I couldn't change that. It has been in the standard for 20 years. You say, Alex, you put it there. Yes, but it's, it's still there. And it's, I have no influence over things I put there. For example, many of them became much worse, and I couldn't, couldn't have stopped them. So, uh, so, but you understand the algorithm. It's, yeah, it's simple. So simple that it's not clear who does the work again. This is the, this is the problem. So, but that's just see. Now we could implement reverse for forward iterators with the help of this guy, and we could have a generic reverse which will send you to the correct reverse guy. Just just showing you the, the stuff. Now, complexity of computation. You probably assume that the notion of complexity of computation was around forever. No, guys. Once upon a time, there was a lab owned by a large company called General Electric. During these times, companies were supposed to fund pure research because they took something from the society and they felt moral obligation to put something back. These were when the United States was a communist country in the 60s. So in 1964, there were engineers or scientists in General Electric Research working on Turing machines. Observe that General Electric was not shipping Turing machines. That was just a contribution to the intellectual life of, of the country. And there were two relatively young scientists, both mathematicians, uh, Yuris Hertmanis and Dick Stearns, who came up with an idea that you should study complexity of computation. They invented the term. Right? It's such an important term that both of them actually won a Turing Award for the paper they published. Turing Award, it's, it's really important. It's a big deal. So uh, they showed that if you look at Turing machines, you know, don't forget. They were General Electric, Turing machine was important, C was not. So they showed the following remarkable results, that there is this hierarchy of computable functions determined by their t number of steps, and that it is a proper hierarchy. In other words, that if you have some function f of n, which is greater than n, more than linear function, which determines how many steps you allow your Turing machines to do with the input size n. And you stop at that point, and then you have another Turing machine, which goes to, say, f square of n steps. Then there are Computable functions, which are implementable in the second, not implementable in the first. That is, if you give the machine more time, you'd actually always do something the old machine couldn't do. And uh, wonderful result. And then they had another guy called Phil Lewis. And Phil Lewis is great degree, a very sort of 
he's the guy who mentored me. The reason I am a computer scientist I am is thanks to him. Phil Lewis the second, not junior, the second. And his great contribution, according to him, was that he stuck his head into the office where these two guys were discussing this stuff and said, why don't you do it for space? So he invented space complexity. He's a very modest guy. So, uh, and he didn't win Turing Award, but he did many other marvelous things. For if any of you took compiler class, you might have learned of LL of N grammars. He invented that. So, uh, major, major computer scientist. And what I know about doing research in computer science is thanks to him. Uh, because, you know, I, I was also General Electric to search. So I, I'm a product of Turing machine. So when you say that, I'm, that's, that's my you know, upbringing. So they invented space complexity. And you will see why I'm talking about it. Sadly enough, in concrete algorithmics, instead of a fine hierarchy of space complexity classes, there are basically two slots. When you look at Knuth, he talks about an algorithm being either in place and in place. Well, it used to be say it uses constant space. But they relaxed it because constant space means that, as Anil rightly puts it, you couldn't even have an integer. Integers theoretically give you logarithmic space. Or in other words, you couldn't have a recursive program with divide and conquer, which with logarithmic space. So nowadays, the formal requirement for in place is that it's a polylogarithmic extra space. But it's not l linear. In the sense, you couldn't copy the data. That you cannot do. And then the second class, which Knuth talks about, it's not in place, which means you could copy all the data. And for example, in volume three, searching and sorting, he talks about two classes of sorting algorithms. In place, things like quicksort, and quicksort obviously needs logarithmic space. It is recursive. Or not in place, merge sort. And then he says merge sort you could just copy everything. Well, guys, life is not like that at all. OK, first of all, before I say this, I am forgetting. So what we could do, if we have all the space which we need, we could implement reverse like that. We could do reverse with buffer. If we have an extra buffer, we copy stuff into buffer, and then do reverse copy backward. Reverse copy is a standard function which does this. It's just copy backwards. So you copy, and you copy back. So reverse. And how many assignments does it do? 2n. So better than 3n, which you will do for some of the algorithms, but not as good as the cycle one. Because here you have to understand another thing. All this counting assignments is all fine and dandy as long as you don't cross cash boundaries. Because then things become very, very complicated. And one piece of research which I desperately want somebody to do, just a hint, is to figure out what, how do you sort of go between these algorithms depending on whether you fit or do not fit in cache. Right? Because if you ignore cache, it's all very simple. I told you everything. It basically depends on which iterator category, and cycle always wins. The problem is that if you miss cache or if you miss secondary cache, it's all complicated. Doing cycles becomes deadly because you miss, miss cache on every, every step. That's pretty bad. So research needs to be done. So reverse copy does this. And then we go finally to this point of mine is that this is not a realistic separation of in place and not in place. Because in reality, what do you have? You always have some extra memory. However big your data structure is, you would have 
maybe half of it you could you know, maybe one quarter maybe 10 percent five percent maybe one percent so it's a by the way even one percent is linear observable but it's a very small linear i actually think claim that if you don't have one percent you're in trouble anyways if you're trying to to run your application and your work set is within 99 percent of your physical memory you're doomed right so all of you know that so but you usually have something so what we need we need algorithms which could adapt if you have five percent they'll use this five percent wisely to do what they need to do right and let us see how we could use that in this reverse and it works like a charm you see if we have an extra buffer b and if we know how large it is it's the same as before we we if if n zero this if and one the same now if you are less than buff less or equal than buffer then you do this reverse n with buffer you just put in the buffer and flip it on the way back and then you do the splits sort of eventually you will fit into the buffer so you're doing recursion on the higher level which is actually perfectly all right because there are very few of these steps what you don't want is you don't want to do recursion when things are very small then it becomes deadly right and as we shall see it appears in whole bunch of algorithms it's a very very general technique so the notion of memory adaptive algorithm is very important and you know I wanted to tell you about it even now now I have to tell you a sad story sort of this is personally sad story sort of long time ago in the early 90s I'm doing all this stuff and they say in in order to have memory adaptive algorithm you need to have a system call where you could call the system and say I need a temporary buffer of at most say 100 gigabytes and the system comes back and say well no you couldn't really have 100 gigabytes you could have five that's very useful it tells you how you know, and it could it knows what the size of physical memory is I don't there is no way of finding out it knows how much physical memory is already given so it could literally figure out how much to give me and give it to me right so I carefully document what it needs to do and then but you couldn't you know I was one of these stupid people I cannot ship the code ship the interface without implementing it so I implemented all of STL including this guy so I wrote the following comment I said this is a bogus implementation it doesn't do anything useful it should be immediately replaced by a vendor specific code and my implementation was very simple I call malloc if it returns zero I cut it by two call it again and call it again and call it eventually it returns something right it's a bogus I, it has no and I wrote it's a bogus implementation because I know nothing about physical memory and now by the way in any operating system it, it always returns because there's always address space it just gives you enormous chunk of address space so guess what all the vendors did everybody found the same solution they removed my comment <laughs> they kept the code the code is still shipped right? which is horrendous and I keep telling this story no effect you know, it's a say, for me, it's a very, very sad story of something which is sensible, which is easy. I'm not talking about some artificial intelligence or, you know, recognizing query by what customer thinks. No, I'm talking about very, very simple stuff. I'm asking, I need temporary storage. I promise not to pin it. I promise to return it. Look at what you have. Give it to me just for this few milliseconds or microseconds or whatever, that will return it back. No. It goes through this 
binary search of Malik. Such is life. So we are reaching the end of the course. The second journey is over. Remember the title. The title was Heirs of Pythagoras. And here, these are my words of wisdom. Hernan was waiting for this. For, I mean, he comes here only for this end of the journey words. <laughs> the punch line, as he put it. So my punch line about Pythagoras. So my claim is that we are heirs of these great people. You say, but who are we? We are junior programmers. Yes, we are. But you become an heir not because you get some money in the bank. Intellectual life is wonderful. You could be heir of Pythagoras just by asking. It's just, it's a way you start viewing things. You say, well, Alex, do you suggest that we drop everything we do and start studying mathematics? No, far it be from it. You, know, you, have to, you have to earn your living, you have to come to work, you have to write code. But you have to decide in what spirit you, I mean, sort of in some sense, if I decide that when I write code, however unimportant, in spirit of Pythagoras, I become his heir. Even if it's the same unimportant code as before. It's the attitude. And what I have been trying to tell you during this sort of course is that we have this remarkable pedigree. And it's not, it's not that we're great, but we had great forefathers. We come from this wonderful, wonderful line of people who have been struggling with understanding algorithms, numbers, algebraic structures, and sort of the only thing which is required in some sense of us is accept that. Right? It's, not, it's not something you, which you need to, to even do much. Well, you could do a little bit. But the important thing is to accept, not to say, I'm just a person with no intellectual pedigree. Right? I'm just, a, if you like, I don't want to appear uh, racist and uh, insult Roma people. But I'm not an intellectual gypsy, if you see what I mean. It's, I, I, I don't just wander around. I'm not claiming Roman people do that. But at least I do not want to do it. I do not, I mean, I want to be rooted in this tradition. I want to venerate people who started this. And if I start venerating computer scientists who are close to me, people like Hertmann and Sturz, then I have to go and venerate von Neumann and Turing. And if I venerate them, I have to venerate Poincaré and Hilbert, and then so on, because it's an unbroken tradition. If you asked von Neumann, he clearly was not a gypsy. He clearly belonged to, to a certain tradition and was proud of it, even when he was working in very practical things. For example, many of these mathematicians were very practical. It's not, I mean, the idea that there is this ivory tower mathematician exists only in the minds of people who know nothing about this tradition. I mean, Poincaré, for example, spent years working on uh, time zones. <coughs> time zones, developing in time zones. I mean, very mundane thing. Somebody needed to do it. Right? So he wasn't just doing celestial mechanics. He was doing practical service to humanity, figuring out what, what is good way of separating the, the time, where to put the timelines. And we still pretty much have whatever he did when, you know, at the end of 19th century. Gauss, as you, if you remember, worked on telegraph. Hardly an you know, ivory tower thing. So that all of them would gladly pick things up. So mathematics doesn't mean that you don't do useful things. It means a certain attitude of mind. And I just wanted at the end of this journey to remind you of that. Now, sort of, this is my words of wisdom. Now, about the next journey. As you know, the next journey will start on July 18th. The reason for it is A, I'm utterly exhausted. I need at least a short break. B, 
I need to prepare. I actually ran out of all of the material. I sort of know abstractly what is journey three, but I couldn't teach it now. I need preparation time. So this is why I'm just explaining why the break. I hope that you will come back. So, you know, because if nobody comes back, then I shouldn't be preparing the journey. I should be preparing the resume. Uh, <laughs> Look, I, you know, if you guys don't come, I think there will be consequences for, for me. But uh, it's going to be the third journey is going to be more, I mean, sort of, you could view this last lecture as a preview for the third journey. There'll be more code, more algorithms. And then we will become a little bit more theoretical again, or a lot more theoretical during the fourth journey, if we live long enough. Okay, so see you July 18th.